All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Rick mentioned, I'm a technical sales engineer with ArcelorMittal. I'm here also with uh, several representatives from my company, so perhaps you've seen us around. Um, but uh, before I get started, I would like to first thank CTBUH for inviting us to present at this uh, session. I'm also presenting alongside my colleagues who are um, in similar interesting industries in the uh, construction world. And I'd like to um, also thank the contributing authors for this article who are Barry Charnish of Intuitive and Rob Chmielewski from MKA. Um, uh, the paper that we wrote is focused on the influence that steel has had on high-rise buildings. Um, and it was interesting as Rick got started uh, introducing our session today, I know that he mentioned that everything that we represent, um, the vertical transportation industry and the steel industry, are obviously very large contributors to the world of the high-rise. So to um, start things off, I'd like to take everybody back in time to the advent of the, uh, of the uh, skyscraper. Um, I have pictured here uh, the Flatiron Building from 1903. That was one year after the building completed its construction. And this was one of the first buildings in New York City that was constructed using a steel frame. Um, that might not sound that intriguing to us today, but back then it was a very big deal. Uh, the first building that was constructed with a uh, complete steel frame was constructed in the late 1800s. And um, if we think about what was going on at that period of time, it's very important to put everything in perspective. You can see here that uh, horse-drawn carriages were all that were roaming the streets at that time. We didn't even have an elevator then. Uh, escalators were just being invented. And in addition to that, uh, the, the uh, production of steel as it was at that point in time was completely different than it had been just 50 years prior. So going back in time, um, back to the early 1800s, um, it's important to note that steel wasn't used, obviously, for construction purposes at that point in time. In fact, steel was only made in very small batches using what's called a crucible steel process. In the crucible process, um, a uh, wrought iron in combination with charcoal was put into a clay pot and then put into a furnace. Um, these furnaces were manned by individuals, like the one pictured here on the right. Um, and that individual was responsible for monitoring the, plot, the pot and ensuring that once the molten steel was created, the pot was removed from the furnace and then put into whatever casting apparatus it was going to be uh, feeding. Now, because it was all manual labor that was transferring all this molten material, we could obviously only make very small batches of steel. So at that point in time, the steel that was produced was used for very small purposes. Cutlery, surgical instruments, and things of that, um, uh, things like that. And so it took several developments in the world of steel production in order for us to get where we were in the 1900s, producing enough steel so that a whole skyscraper could be constructed using it. One of the first advances that took place um, was the creation of the hot blast. Um, this is credited to James Beaumont Nielsen. Um, he was working in the Scottish steelworks industry in the late or in the mid 1830s, and he was uh, he strove to develop a technology that would make it more efficient to heat furnaces in order to melt down iron. In order for iron to melt, the furnaces that are fed with the material have to reach temperatures of more than 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, at this point in time, back in the 1830s, the fuel that was used to uh, fuel these furnaces was either coke or coal. Coal came straight from the ground, but it had a very high ignition point. Coal, uh, I'm sorry, coal came straight from the ground, but had a very high ignition point. Coke, on the other hand, was a derivative of coal that was produced by baking the coal at, at elevated temperatures, and it subsequently had a lower ignition point. And as a result, coke was the preferred fuel for the production of uh, molten iron at that point in time. Um, and the reason for that is because the blast that was used to blow air across the material and ignite it was a cold blast. 
But what James Beaumont Nielsen proposed was that if you blew hot air onto the um, onto the fuel, you would be able to fuel the uh, heat in the furnace a lot more efficient, efficiently. And so as a result, he proposed using the hot air to um, heat the uh, fuel. Um, this enabled uh, uh, iron producers to start using coal rather than coke in order to fuel their furnaces. And it also reduced uh, the um, the cost of, uh, or I'm sorry, it, re it reduced the heating costs um, by 33% just by using that hot blast rather than the um, cold blast to heat the material. So once he had developed that, production of steel became much more efficient from a fuel standpoint. The next, um, the next invention that had a very big impact on the production of steel was the creation of the Bessemer converter. Now the Bessemer converter, um, you can't really tell here, but it's a very, very large piece of machinery. With a Bessemer converter, you're able to make up to 15 tons of steel in one go. So as you can imagine, that's significantly different than the crucible process before it. Henry Bessemer developed this process in the 1850s when he was trying to make steel production more efficient for military ordnance. And he found that um, if, if air was blown through the, the molten iron, they were able to remove impurities from the iron very efficiently. And um, when you're producing steel, um, you always start with iron, but it's important to take out impurities and create what's called pig iron. And then that pig iron is combined with different alloying elements to create steel. The Bessemer converter was a very efficient process for creating that pig iron. Um, by blowing air directly through the material, uh, you're able to grab onto all of the impurities that you don't want in your steel and then take it out from the rest of the um, material. With the Bessemer process, as I said, you could produce up to 15 metric tons of uh, molten iron in one go, and it only took 20 minutes to produce this much material. So this obviously set the stage for much more um, higher qu quantities of steel to be produced. Now, in addition to that, um, not only was it important for us to start producing molten steel more efficiently, but we also had to start producing structural shapes similar to the ones that you see today. So a third advancement that had a significant impact on steel production is uh, the invention of the wide flange beam, or um, the gray beam, as it's often referred to. The wide flange beam was invented by a gentleman, a gentleman named Henry Gray in the late 1800s while he was working in the steel industry in the United States. At that, at that point in time, I-shaped members were produced in a rolling mill, quite similar to what we have today, but the rolling mills were missing one rolling stand in their configuration that allowed control on the uh, width of the flanges themselves. So Henry Gray, he developed a technology where you could control that width, and he also simultaneously developed a technology where you could, could control the thickness of the flange and the thickness of the uh, web itself. Prior to Henry's uh, invention, wide flange sections or I-shaped members as they were at that point in time all had a uniform thickness, so they weren't very efficient members. And as a result, um, uh, steel buildings, even when they were first being constructed, were limited in height to about 20 stories or so. Henry's invention of the wide flange section enabled us to reach much higher with wide flange or with uh, steel construction, and as a result, set the stage for us to go much, much higher with buildings than we ever had before. Now, in addition to all of those great technologies that were developed back in the 1800s, we had to take that into steel mills and produce steel efficiently, as efficiently as possible. So the first large-scale steel mills that were used to produce structural sections were all based on blast furnace technology. And as you can see in this schematic, a blast furnace is uh, pictured as you see here. Thanks. <laughs> Um, a blast furnace is pictured as you see here, where you feed all of your uh, raw materials up into the top of the furnace, and then you heat the whole cavity of the furnace. 
as those raw materials drop through the furnace, they eventually heat up to more than 2,000 degrees Celsius, and then they'll turn into molten material. Now, with a blast furnace, after you have that molten, molten material, all that you have is pig iron, again, which isn't steel. So you have to take all of that molten material and move to a basic oxygen, oxygen furnace, where you take out more impurities from the material and where you change the chemistry of it to make steel. And once you do that, um, you're able to make structural steel shapes up at, the, up at a rolling mill. So blast furnace technology, as I, um, as I mentioned, it was the first technology that was used in the production of steel shapes. Um, but eventually, um, we moved along to what's called a mini mill. And a mini mill, like the one that you pictured here, or see pictured here, is, uh, uses what's called an electric arc furnace to produce this, the uh, molten steel. An electric arc furnace, um, has the capacity to produce molten steel, up to 160 tons of it, um, in just 40 minutes. And by using such an efficient technology, uh, or in addition to that, um, you, the raw materials that feed an electric arc furnace don't come directly from the ground. They actually come from other steel industries, such as the construction industry. Steel from the mill is used to feed an electric arc furnace. Steel from the automotive, um, household appliances, or packaging industries all go into feeding an electric arc furnace. So, um, once the electric arc furnace technology was introduced and we started using mini mills to create structural shapes, we started creating structural shapes that were much more sustainable and environmentally efficient than they had been in the past as well. Now, um, the Production of molten steel is obviously one very important aspect of um, producing a shape, but then what's also very important is the rolling process itself. So once we have our molten steel, what we'll do is we, t we start producing a structural shape. Um, and pictured here is just a, a schematic of the production process at our mills. Um, and you start, as I said, with a scrap base, and then that feeds an electric arc furnace. From the electric arc furnace, you go along to a ladle furnace where you uh, uh, are able to adjust the chemistry of the steel by adding alloying elements. And then you go along to a continuous caster where you start making that um, initial uh, uh, shape of material, which is referred to as a beam blank or a bloom. From there, you can go along to a rolling mill where sections are actually rolled out to the dimensional properties um, of uh, whatever specification is being produced. Now it's in this process that we achieve high yield strengths of our steel. Um, by applying force to those sections, we're able to increase the strength of the material. Now historically, there have been um, two primary rolling processes that have been used in the production of steel shapes. Uh, the first is what's called a hot rolling process. And in a hot rolling process, you heat the beam blank to a very elevated temperature, and then you'll apply all of the force to it at those elevated temperatures. In the 1950s, uh, we started using what's called a thermomechanical rolling process to produce structural shapes. In this type of process, we were able to achieve higher yield strengths because we would uh, roll the section out at an elevated temperature, we would allow it to cool slightly, and then we would roll it again at a lower temperature. And because we were applying forces at those lower temperatures, we were able to produce finer, um, finer elements composing the section, and we were able to achieve higher strengths of material. So when you look at the hot rolling process, that's typically the process that was used when we were producing A36 steel or 36 KSI steel. And that was the norm up until the 1950s or so. After that, with the thermomechanical rolling process, we were much, uh, it was much more likely that we could achieve a higher yield strength of up to 50 KSI um, very reliably. And as a result, um, we were able to reach higher with our buildings. Now, recently, um, in the 1980s, there was introduced an advancement to steel production, which is known as the quenching and self-tempering process. The quenching and self-tempering process is a process that's applied to steel shapes after they've been rolled to their final dimensions. 
It happens in the rolling mill, right at the end of the rolling stand. And the quenching and self-tempering process, what we do during it is we will rapidly cool the material from the exterior, and then we allow it to reheat itself from encapsulated energy, and thereby achieve a higher yield strength of material while maintaining good um, ductility characteristics of the material. So as you can see in this photograph um, from within the mill, uh, this section is entering the QST bank at an elevated temperature. In the bank, it's sh uh, showered from the exterior using water. And then as it exits the bank, it slowly reheats itself um, from the inside out to temper or achieve that higher yield strength, or um, yes, achieve that higher yield strength. So all of these advancements in steel technology have really had a big influence on the construction world. And as I said, back in the late 1800s, we saw construction of the first high-rise building. This building, which no longer stands, is the Rand, Rand McNally Building, and it was constructed in Chicago. It was the first building with an all-steel frame to be constructed, and it stood 10 stories for the 30 years that it stood. Now, after this building was constructed, as I said, it was constructed um, uh, in the late 1800s, which meant the steel that it was constructed with had about a yield strength of 20 KSI or so. Now, as we were advancing the steel production process, we got to a point where we were making 36 KSI steel. In addition, this building was constructed using built-up sections, or they're known as Z-bar shapes. And those were also inefficient and very costly to fabricate and construct. So as um, once Henry Gray introduced the wide flange beam, then we were able to do, um, roll much deeper sections and the fabrication of a building became much more efficient. So in the 1930s, construction really, uh, the construction of high-rise buildings really started to take off. And so you can see pictured here is the Chrysler Building, which this was the first uh, steel-framed building that became the tallest structure in the world. Um, it did so in the late 19, or in 1930. And it stood as the tallest structure until uh, 11 months later, when the Empire State Building, which I think several of us had a chance to visit last night, surpassed it. After um, the advancement to the thermal mechanical rolling process and the uh, introduction of even higher grade steel, buildings such as the Willis Tower in Chicago and the Sears Tower pictured here started to go up. These buildings were constructed with steel with yield strengths of 46 to 50 KSI, and again, they became the tallest buildings in the world of their time. Today, high-rise buildings are continually constructed using steel. Even buildings that don't have uh, steel frames have steel inside the concrete in the form of rebar. But in the United States alone, more than 50% of the buildings that are, or of the uh, high-rise buildings that are above 500 feet tall are constructed using structural steel shapes. And in addition to that, as buildings become more complex, such as the 150 North Riverside building, which perhaps some of you had a chance to hear about, I know Jim Getch was talking about it yesterday, this building has a very unique um, architectural profile, and in order to achieve it, uh, the envelope of steel uh, strengths had to be pushed as high as possible. So this building includes steel that has yield strengths of 65 KSI, steel that has yield strengths of 70 KSI, and it also uses some of the heaviest shapes in the world. Uh, wide flange sections in this building go up to 925 pounds per foot. As you can imagine, we've come a lot farther than the um, built-up structural shapes of 20 KSI uh, material that we were using back in the construction of the Rand McNally building. And beyond that, uh, the quenching and self-tempering process that's used to make high-strength steels today is able to produce steel of up to 80 KSI. So we're able to go even higher with our uh, buildings with much more efficient structures, lightweight structures, as Rick um, referred to earlier, very, very easily with this type of high-strength material.
So we'll continue to see the landscape of our cities change. And hopefully as they move forward, steel will be a large contributing factor to the construction of these um, high rise buildings.